Yeah, four plans. Anyone else you want one? War plans. Planes? Did I put planes? No. Oh, I couldn't be surprised if I did. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're here. Welcome to Shoalhaven Baptist Church. This is Sunday school time. And we have a couple of guests. Welcome, Peter, and uh, Pastor Mansour and his wife. Uh, pleased to have them with us today. And, uh, yeah, and you too, all the rest of you. And you at home. Wherever you are, good to see you. Well, that's not right, is it? I can't see you folks at home. Hopefully you can see me. Okay, so we're in Joshua and uh, in Chapter 5 this morning. But there is a more important thing. Well, there is an important thing that I need to do first up, of course, and I'm probably going to need somebody to... Who hasn't got a memory verse card? We need to check our memory verse. Pastor Hall, will you want to distribute a couple of those? Okay, so we have a memory verse each month and this month it's John chapter 3 verse 36 and so uh, and then we have chocolate coated rewards for those who can memorise the verse. What have we got next Sunday is the, are we having Sunday school? Yeah we are. Yeah, yeah we're having Sunday school next. It's Good Friday. No it's not, we forget that. It's Good Sunday. Yes, Resurrection Sunday. Yes, but we'll be having Sunday school classes even so. So um, next week we'll check and see who knows the memory verse. Who thinks they know it now? Yeah, right, only I know that one would do, yes. Don't, you don't know it, Nathan? You can't remember? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you do, yes. Okay, but let's say it together. And you've got a card in front of you. So uh, say it together with me. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John chapter 3, verse 36. Now, somebody explain to me, is this verse correct as it's written on your card? No. And I'm not to blame for this, which is unusual. Normally I am. Okay, uh, the not, he that believeth, uh, the, on. the on, is it? The on, yes, the on, yes, the on. He, uh, and he that believeth not, forget about the on, the son, okay? So we'll do it the proper way. Sorry to be leading up the garden path these weeks, but some young man pointed it out to me the other day that we didn't get it quite right. That's all right. So let's say it together one more time. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John chapter 3, verse 36. Okay, worth remembering. Good to hide God's word in your heart. Um, if your only reason for learning the memory verses to get the chocolate reward well, okay, at least you've learnt the memory verse, you know. So that's good. All right, so we're in Joshua now. Last week um, we were talking um, uh, about uh, the things that um, were happening as, as the children of Israel were, were getting ready to go across the Jordan River and uh, they... Uh, they went across and we talked about the memorial that they uh, built on the other side of the Jordan River. Uh, do you remember what that was? Can anyone tell me? What was that memorial? The 12 stones that uh, uh, Joshua told the men to pick up out of uh, the uh, riverbed and they made a memorial on the other side and that memorial was so that in future times when the children asked what's this heap of stones here for, they would say, this is for us to remember uh, that the Lord God stopped the Jordan River 
and we walked across on dry land. And so that was what that memorial was about. We talked about memorials that we have. Can you remember what, any of the memorials that we had? We talked about them. So what's that? The Lord's Supper is a memorial reminding of Christ's death. And what else have we got? Baptism. Yeah, likewise a memorial. Uh, we remember um, our own uh, salvation. And what was the other one? The Bible. Okay, God's Word, which is a continuing memorial and reminds us of God and who he is and what he is. So we talked about all those things. Okay, so, good. War plans. Um, God understands the principle that if we fail to plan, uh, we plan to fail. And in fact, before the Israelites could enter the promised land uh, and claim what was already theirs, remember it's theirs because God's promised it to them, um, they had to uh, stop what they were doing and develop some war plans. But Israel's uh, war plans uh, weren't that tactical kind of plans, you know, like um, you know, some map laid out in front of them and you're going to go here and this group's going to go here and we're going to attack here or whatever. That wasn't what they were doing. Um, they weren't establishing some sort of order of battle, but their planning had more to do with um, dotting I's and crossing T's with God. In other words, getting themselves right with God and sorting the things out that God wanted them to do. So remember, this is a nation that's um, been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. And so some of their connections with God aren't quite there. And God doesn't do anything in a haphazard way. And when God uh, created life, he started with the simple grass and the green things, the trees and whatever, and he finished up with that most complex of all creations, you and I, the, the human beings. So that's the way he did it. And God placed the earth in a perfectly ordered position so that we wouldn't be too far from the sun and we wouldn't be too close and we'd spin around at the right pace and all of the stuff that God did. Uh, all of these things that those who are evolutionists claim just happened, just as it happens, you know. But God knew what to do. He knew what was going to happen to his creation. He understood the plan to redeem his creation. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God understood, God knew what was going on and got out of love for his creation gave his son Jesus Christ as payment for the sins of the world and uh, we know about that don't we and uh, we call this God's plan of salvation God has a plan trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour believe he's the son of God you know how it goes believe that he died on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for your sins believe that he rose again three days later, that he's seated at the right hand of God. This is God's plan of salvation. God has a plan. God knows what's going on. And God had a plan for Israel in this situation here as well. And since God doesn't do anything in a haphazard way and since God has, has planned eventual redemption for humankind um, by the creation of a new heaven and a new earth and all that stuff that's going to happen and, and rapture of the saints and all those things that we understand and know about, you can read in Revelation. Um, we're made in the image of God and we need to develop some plans too. And there needs to be plans for the work that we do for his kingdom here. So after the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and stepped onto the promised land they had to pause and they had to reflect on things they had to consider they had to get in touch with God and that's good advice for us too isn't it if we're going to go out and do something important what do we need to do we need to get in touch with God say hey God is this a good idea and God sometimes says yeah and occasionally says no but we need to pray and ask and seek God's advice on things so uh, we need to do those things so let's have a little look at the scriptures and see uh, what we're doing here. So we're looking at Joshua chapter, 50, chapter 5 
and uh, we probably won't read all of the verses, but let me start over on this side and have uh, you read uh, a few verses. Let's... Uh, uh, dear, dear, dear. I think we could probably read down to about verse 6, okay? So that's a bit tricky. There's some interesting bits in here. You're all adults. You all know about this. So it's, I mean, it's in the Bible. You should have read it before already. I hope there's no surprises here for you. Okay, can you start, uh, James, in uh, the first verse in chapter 5? Joshua chapter 5. Okay, so here we see um, uh, an issue that wasn't dealt with being, being sorted out. If we want the blessings of God, let's have a look. We're exploring the principle and uh, identifying with God here. Uh, yes, we are. Um, if, if we want the blessings of God, we, we must identify with God. And identification with God is a key, uh, the winning strategy uh, that uh, we would have and that Joshua had too. And we can overlook the fact that those who we try to reach um, uh, should see the, and, and perceive us as God's people. You know, it's important that they do. From the time of Abraham to the uh, taking of the promised land, even until the present time, uh, Israel has identified themselves as God's people by circumcision. And uh, you can read about it in Genesis 17 there. Uh, and this covenant of circumcision was a distinguishing mark and it identified the Jewish people as God's people. Circumcision wasn't practised uh, during that uh, Israel's 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, their wilderness journey. At Kadesh Benea, when the uh, Israelites refused to obey God, you remember that? They refused to go into the promised land on their first opportunity to do so. You know, and Joshua and Caleb, and Caleb stood up and said, yes, we can, and the rest of the mob said, no, we can't. And so they spent the next 40 years wandering around as a result. And all of those who said, no, it's too hard, God dealt with. And there wasn't any of them left by the time they have got to this point in, in their history. Here they are on the uh, west side of the Jordan River, and God's winning strategy was uh, for Israel once again to identify uh, with him. And that's what we see. In verse 8 it says, And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal until this day. Okay, so um, here we see that... Now, what would be the reproach of Egypt? 
they were slaves in Egypt, weren't they? And they were held down. They were considered worthless, just, you know, just slaves. And now they've, they've come out of Egypt and God is, and they've wandered around the wilderness for a long time, really getting nowhere, really not really doing anything much at all. And looked upon, I suppose, by many of the peoples and nations around us, a bunch of losers, really. They had no land. They'd come from Egypt as slaves and there they were just wandering around. And so that was how they were perceived. But now, as we look at uh, what's happening to them, um, they're once again identifying with God through circumcision. And circumcision of the heart, the inward salvation, has always been what God intended for us as that identifying mark of his people, identifying characteristic um, of those uh, who were uh, God's people. And uh, see if I can find Colossians here. I'll get it in a minute and I'll read it for you. I hate it when I can't. Well, that's the problem. There's a paper clip in the way. Um, Colossians 2.11 In him also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So I'm buried with him in baptism wherein you also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So we see here, that's what God wants for us too, that identification, that identifying with Christ, a public identifying with Christ and his church. Now, if you walked in the door here this morning or if you go to church um, and, and people know that, um, you identify, don't you? As, you? as you're coming in, you identify uh, as who you are. My neighbours and your neighbours too would know that Sunday morning you hop in your car and drive off, or well, unless you're Ben, you walk. Gary walks too, don't you Gary? Um, some of us walk, some of us drive, but people recognise that's what we're doing. What are you doing Sunday morning? Oh, they're going to church. Yes. We're identified. Because Israel once again identified with God through circumcision, the kings on the west side of the Jordan recognised that these were God's people. Israel, God is strong and powerful. Israel's enemies didn't stand a chance. That's what it talks about. If you have a look in the first verse, came to pass when the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we're passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was there any spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. And if we're looking forward a little bit, we'll go there next week probably, we look at Jericho, what happened to Jericho? They were scared. They locked the place down. And uh, everyone seemed to be that way, quite fearful and um, trying to get around the thing. To win a war, you must have a winning strategy, but you need a winning spirit. You need to believe that you can win. And when we think we're going to lose, that's probably what's going to happen. I mean, sometimes we're pleasantly surprised. I watched the... Uh, you probably don't. But I, I watched the uh, rugby, the real rugby, last night and uh, the Western Force, the West Australian team, uh, beat the Queensland team. Mixed kind of blessings for me. I'm West Australian, so I'm a Western Force supporter, I suppose, in a mild sort of a way. But it was a totally unexpected thing. Um, I'm not sure if they were expecting to win, but they did. Uh, sometimes it can happen unexpectedly, but most of the time if we're thinking we're going to lose, that's what happens. 
and if we think we can win, well then maybe we can. Um, we need to identify with God because our enemies will know it and perhaps like happened here to Joshua, uh, our enemies are going to realise, well, God's on their side. How are we going to win? Well, we're not going to win against God. We can win with God. We can. So uh, to do God's work in the, in the place where God has put us, we need to be identified with God. We need to be seen as God's people. We must therefore dot our I's and cross our T's with God, get things right with God and make sure that things are okay. All right, moving on to remove the stigma. Forty years earlier in the wilderness uh, of Paran, there at uh, Kadesh Barnea, they refused to claim the promised land and so they developed this stigma, a mark of disgrace. That's what stigma is, okay? Look up, I had to look it up in the dictionary and that's a mark of disgrace. There may be other things too, but that is what it is. As a, a, a nation of uh, disobedient losers, that's what they were known as previously. However, once Israel identified with God again, God said uh, in verse 9, And the Lord said unto Joshua this day, Have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you? Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Well, <clears throat> the name Gilgal literally means rolling away. And uh, when God rolled away the reproach of Egypt, he removed Israel's loser stigma. And uh, he said, you guys are on my side. Well, I'm on your side, I suppose. God no longer saw Israel as a reproach, as a loser nation. God saw Israel and the people, his people, as a mighty army, poised and ready to take on the promised land. And some people think, uh, as we talk about independent Baptist churches, uh, that they're irrelevant, uh, without purpose. Some people don't even know they exist. At the moment, some of you might be aware that we're coming under a certain attack from certain people who happen to think that all IB churches are useless can't get things right but that's just not the case you know we need to remove that stigma change our community's attitude toward us and identify ourselves with God as God's people and see what great things we can do you know I don't mind bragging a little bit about Shoalhaven Baptist Church because it's you and it's God's work but we've been able to do some pretty decent things in recent times. Not necessarily great and big and, you know, newsworthy in some senses, but good things. And uh, uh, so we continue to do that. We're committed to God's work and we want God to be with us. We identify with God. There's a sign out the front that tells people who we are. And so we want to be committed to him. And we're the people of God. And when we claim our heritage and identify with God, our attitude changes. And when our attitude changes, we can realise we're not without power. We're not a bunch of losers. We're not failures. <coughs> we're working with God to do the things that the Lord wants us to do. To preach and teach and baptise had a lovely thing happen this morning as I walked in the door. One of our little kids, little Sunday school children, came up to me and said, Pastor, can I ask you a question? And I said, well, yes, of course. And this little one said to me, can I get baptised? And I said, sure you can. Are you trusting Jesus as your saviour? And they said, yes. So we'll organise that, won't we? Uh, we have another baptism to organise as well. So isn't it wonderful, though, 
when those things happen. You know, we're not failures. We're not hopeless. We're doing the things God wants us to do. We're God's people. And when we claim the heritage that we have and identify with God, we can be successful. We remove the stigma, develop a winning attitude and face our promised land with a mindset that tells others we're God's people. And we have faith and we can accomplish anything that we choose to do that's within the will of God. Surely we can claim what God has already given us. You know, Baptist churches have never been sort of known for glitz and glamour. Well, ours isn't anyway. <laughs> it's just not the way it is. Bible preaching, Christian fellowship and uh, spiritual worship, that's what we're, we're known for. That's what we want to be known for. You know, demographics prove that every church can't be a mega church. There are always big uns and little uns, and we're a little un, but many Baptist churches are like that, smaller churches, but even so, God uses them. He does use them to do mighty work, you know, and uh, to do the things that God uh, wants done. Let's have a look at uh, accepting God's leadership. When Israel identified with God, removed the stigma of that loser nation, it was mature enough to stand on its own. The people celebrated the Passover. The Bible tells us that. Um, verse 10 says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And it goes on to tell us that the manna ceased. God stopped providing for them because the land, the new land they were in, had provisions. People celebrated the Passover and they ate the produce of the land. And it seems God is saying to these uh, uh, children of Israel, you're my people. Um, you have uh, associated yourself with me. Uh, the covenant of circumcision has been uh, renewed and this is a new Israel. This is not the same Israel that was made up of those people who refused to do uh, and go and accept that God could fight for them, that God could do it at Kadesh Barnea. 40 years later, this is a new people, a new Israel, ready to roll into the promised land, ready to do as God asked them. A short time later near Jericho, Joshua lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And as we read this, uh, perhaps I'll read on. Verse 14, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? Who do you think this is that's appearing to Joshua? Jesus Christ. It is. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And so here the Lord is speaking to Joshua. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Do you remember somebody else who had a very similar experience? Moses. Moses, before the burning bush, the Lord's appearing there in the burning bush. Take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. And here again, uh, the same thing for Joshua. 
And you might be thinking here, well, uh, the Lord of hosts didn't give Joshua an answer regarding the plans for war. What are we going to be doing to be victorious? The, the Lord of hosts didn't lay out, you know, go here, do this, do that, and I'll be with you and so on. You know, sometimes that has happened and God has done that, but not in this case. And God didn't, didn't have to. Uh, Joshua and Israel as a nation had accepted God's leadership. Now they've crossed over, they've built their memorial, uh, they've done the circumcision and re, uh, reinforced the, the covenant of God between his people and him and there they are ready. And accepting God's leadership is the strategy that we need. God in his own way would lead Israel into battle. And when we'll talk about it next week, I think, uh, the wonderful story of, the, of Jericho and the walls falling down. I mean, who would ever have thought, you know, marching around a city a couple of times would make the walls fall down? We'll talk about it some more next week. But um, God had his own plan. The important part here was that the people of Israel now said, yes, God, uh, you're our God and we're going to do the things that you ask us to do. Our strategy should be to identify with God because we're God's people. And the truth is, no church can do business in the promised land, which of course is down here on the south coast. Um, <laughs> Um, without identifying with God, uh, without removing that, uh, the reproach and, and, and without removing that stigma that, you know, we're useless and no good because we're not. With God's leadership, we can do the things that God asks us to do. Let's have a look at grasping the principle. On July the 20th in 1969, and I remember where I was. Do you remember where you were? When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon? I was working for an uh, automotive company in Western Australia, and down the road in the shopping centre there was a, an electrical store that sold electrical stuff. And in the window of their store they had a TV and it was there so that you could see the TV and so that you could go and buy one from them. But we all marched down there about lunchtime, I think it was around about that time, to watch as Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Amazing. It was fabulous. Neil Armstrong, the astronaut, became the first man to set his foot on the moon. That was the moment that Neil Armstrong said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And what we probably don't know is, and we don't think about, we think about there's Neil Armstrong saying these things and how wonderful it was, but we forget that there were 218,000 other people working in the background to get him there. There's always people in the background. Church work isn't rocket science. And when we unite and identify with God, when we remove the stigma and start rolling, we'll know what Gilgal is all about. It's that place where the stigma goes and we move on. And when we accept God's leadership, realising God's on our side, then and only then can we become the church and the people that God want us to be. So why should we stand on the west side of the Jordan River staring across at the promised land when we can identify with God and remove the stigma, accept God's leadership and do business? Right here in the promised land, we should, that's what we're doing. So as we apply the principle, 
for you to think about. What have I got up there? Or claim, thought to claim. My war plan includes identifying with God, removing any reproachful <laughs> stigma from my life and accepting God's leadership. Amen. That's what happened at Gilgale. <coughs> All right. Damn me. Finished early. Any questions? Okay. All right. Let's have a word of prayer, which I should have done at the beginning, but we'll pray now. Uh, Pastor Hall. Okay, thank you. I can't take all the credit for these things. I stole much of the material from others. Nonetheless, if you've benefited, praise God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessings toward us and our church. Thank you, Lord, for showing us uh, Joshua and the children of Israel as they turned to be uh, your people and how you worked wonderfully with them. Pray, Heavenly Father, you'll bless the balance of this day for us. Bless our preacher today, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.